Hey everybody, I'm Lindsay Harper, your guide for this episode of Green Going Forward. Today, we're gonna to learn about fuel efficient stoves that combat indoor air pollution, the number four killer on the globe. Who's gonna teach us about it? Dr. Hassan Crockett, Associate Professor at Morehouse College right here in Atlanta. I hear it's a pretty dirty job, so first I gotta pull back my hair and take off my jewelry. Come on, let's go meet Dr. Crockett. Dr. Crockett, thank yes. you so much for having thank us. Thank you, Lindsay, for having me. This is great, man. So tell me, tell me about how you assess the need for this particular technology stove. Well, you know, Lindsay, we were in Johannesburg, South Africa, visiting, and we went to a township called Alexandria. Okay. And at the end of the day, we noticed how much smoke was in the township. It was a blanket of smoke. And we asked our guide, what is all this smoke? He said, well, people are cooking. This is normal. We finally ran into someone who we told him about it. He said, you know what? Go see this man, and he can tell you how to build a stove that will eliminate the smoke. He said, oh, wow. come on, please. How do you so, separate smoke from smoke? I know. That's what we found out. <laughs> how was that experience? We took them here in the States, and they were trained in Alabama at a place called CFAT. We went to this famous engineer. He's been doing this for 30-some years, uh, Dr. Larry Wendonowski, okay. and he taught us how to build fuel-efficient stoves. And then we said, okay, with this knowledge, we'll take you over to South Africa. And so we took these students, seven Morehouse men, That's men of Morehouse, yes, we took them over to South Africa and taught them or showed them how to train people how to build these fuel efficient stoves. We partnered with Howard University. In hey, fact, hey, that's yes, my alma that's mater. School. Yes, we partnered with Howard. In fact, the method that we use here, we call it appropriate technology. Okay. That means people can use materials in their environment to solve their particular problems. This is a movement that allows for us to work in developing countries using the materials that they have, using the expertise that they have, and then the solve the problems that they have, be it health, in this case cooking, be it uh, sanitation, all these kind of problems can be solved with, we know, appropriate technology. How do you see that affecting the students? How, what did they come away with from that experience? To actually see like, okay, I can really take a small step, educate someone in the community that, that you might not think has the biggest influence and just watch it spread like wildfire. And, you know, you almost take that formula with anyways. I, once I know what I need to do to fix the problem, the hard part is over. You know, we call this experiential learning. Mm -hmm. That is, they get the experience and they get the learning. And they also call it service learning and they perform a service. And they really bonded with the people there. Hey, these people aren't just as the same as me on a day-to-day -day basis. Becoming more aware and being more proactive to actually do something. That's, that's, that's definitely the change. Dr. Crockett set up a demonstration to show us what lazy fire looks like. This is what happens when you have what we call lazy fire. Lazy fire. That is, the, all of the flame goes everywhere. It doesn't concentrate itself so it can do the cooking. Okay. So this is the type of smoke that you have with a lazy fire. The women and the girls are the ones who do the cooking and therefore they're the ones who suffer from this open flame. And then you're cooking at least once a day. This contributes to all those kind of diseases, this kind of smoke. And just think sitting around with this for hour after hour after day hour, after day, day after, after, year after all after your year. life. Generation after generation. Generation after generation. Imagine this inside. 
Children are the most vulnerable group to poor indoor air quality by far because they have immature defense mechanisms in the lung. African American and Hispanic children are two to three more times likely to require emergency care, hospitalization, and sadly two to three more times likely to die of asthma. The poor tend to reside in smaller living spaces and live in closer proximity to cooking and fumes. Older citizens have weakened defense mechanisms. So then like people with like asthma. I think it would be the high income income person because the they tend to overuse stuff just because they have, you know, a lot of that thing. Just because there is a lot of Lysol in the house, they will use a lot of Lysol in the house. elderly people, people that might have asthma. Well, I guess babies, of course. People with asthma. I would say children, but because they really, they're really unaware and can't really control their environments. But if you're never alone, you're always around other people, you can't really control what your environment is going to be. So these misconceptions that somehow indoor air quality is not as bad as outdoor air quality, which receives a lot of publicity, really is a fallacy. And one of the things that you need to think about is the concentration of those things that are harmful in your living space is far greater than those things that are diluted in the greater atmosphere around you. Plus, you know, we spend more time in one place, i.e. our homes, specifically our bedrooms, than any other place in a given 24-hour cycle. Uh, some things that might affect indoor air quality might be, oh, people's strong perfume. That's, don't you hate that like, when people come by and it's like... I think air conditioning, um, smoking, uh, the things we clean with, the things we mask odors with. Uh, some things that might affect indoor air quality might be if you have a TV running, that might increase like the heat that might be generated from the device, and this could uh, affect uh, indoor air quality. Um, aroma, definitely. People's energy, um, negative energy that can affect my space. Even think driving affects indoor air quality because how could it not? I mean, outside air transfers to inside indoor air, so. Is in between the kitchen and my bedroom? It depends. Uh, definitely my room. I spend most of my time in my room because, you know, I sleep about eight hours a day, you know, each night. I've actually recently turned my bedroom into my living room or my living room into my bedroom. I spend most of my time probably in the kitchen. A parent or an uncle or grandmother living in the same space, even if they smoke in a different room, we know that the smoke particles travel throughout the house. An interesting fact is if we look at carcinogens and tar, oftentimes what comes out of the uh, burning end of the cigarette is actually more potent or more lethal than what comes out the filtered end that the smoker takes. But what is important is we now find, we, we talk about genetics. Most of us think that genetics are something you're born with, it determines what goes on, you got the set. There's now evidence that pollution, both indoor and outdoor, can actually change subtle things about genes within people during their lifetime uh, that then becomes inherited. It's a totally different way of looking at genetics, which we tend to think is kind of like the deck that you were dealt. Dude, definitely work out and eat healthy, just make conscious decisions, because if he also had diabetes and you change the way that you eat, you might not have it. If you want to succumb to something, then that's how it happens. But if you know you're vulnerable to something, you would take the extra measures. They got things out there that can help you. Even your mindset, um, believing that you're not going to be sick or, um, you know, just believing that you're healthy, I think has a lot to do with it. Flying dust, clean not smoke, uh, bent the, the uh, cooking areas, open your windows, simple low cost things. And now, here comes the fun part, stove making time. We're using just the regular materials that people have all over the world, 
mud and straw. Hey, you can't beat that. Nope, can't beat that. Well, let's get started. <laughs> okay. Concrete, dirt, of course, and straw. Now, we're doing a simulation. Right. Because ordinarily, you want three piles of straw and three piles of dirt okay. and one pile of cement. Okay, the straw insulates the uh, clay. So what we have here is some wire. All right. Put it on there. Okay, now watch. When we sift it, see all those little rocks? Oh, yeah. We don't need those. We just uh -huh. pitch those out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right. That works. Now this straw, as you can see, has been chopped into fine pieces of straw. Said it was gonna get a little dirty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. That's how we what we have now is the dirt that's in the cement, mm -hmm. and we're prepared to mix it together. And actually, we're making uh, mud out of it. Okay. Okay. So you put a little hole. Could you really do this by yourself? Yeah, yeah. Could you? Because it seems like it'd be a great way to, to yeah. bring the community together. You can, but it'd be an excellent way to bring the community yeah, together. Yeah, for sure. So how long do these stoves last? <laughs> they last for quite some time. Do they? Mm -hmm. So it's not like a one-use kind of thing? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, you that's use, even better. Oh, yeah, you can use them for quite some time. All right, so now what we want to do is add the straw. Okay. So we take a little bit of it. All right. Okay, kind of sprinkle it in. I'm going to cut another mold, but this is our mold. All right. And this is the uh, PVC pipe. Again, universal. You know, really? PVC. I didn't know that. You find these all over the all over the world. Oh, that's great. You put one in here mm -hmm. in order to make the chimney. Okay. Okay. And then <clears throat> one in here, and see it's cut to fit. So. See, as a matter of fact, there's a, if I can tell this over, there's a hole there's in the bottom, the as bottom as well. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Okay. And it's cut to fit. Okay. So that it would, you put it through here. There. Yeah. Gotcha. And, oh, look at that. Mm-hmm. And it fits. Okay. As you can see, it fits directly together. And now, what we would do, we're not going to do. Build we around just start the pipe. packing, packing ah, it in, there. Okay. packing it in, there. Gotcha. packing it, packing it until it reaches to the very top. Gotcha. Oil the pipes, mm -hmm. we'll oil the, all the pipes, and oil the sides, all right. and again it'll come out. Okay. Ooh, it's everywhere. <sighs> Ordinarily, we use newspaper, which I don't have, but this is okay. It's something that will. And see, the way this is constructed, this is the, the chimney. Again, this is called a rocket stove. This part is so hot that it burns up the smoke. Smoke is oil. So that is so hot that it burns up the smoke. And under here, you have a air pocket and the air goes through there, comes up the chimney, and it gives it, and that's what makes it uh, burn fast. Okay. okay, that gives it, it, that air coming through there, it is sucked up through there, and that's what makes it burn.
Now we get a little uh, initial smoke because we got paper. Once the paper gets out of the way, then we get rid we get rid of the uh, of the smoke. It's burning good. Mm -hmm. You see how the you see how the it's fire, sucking you see in. how it's Look sucking in. Yeah, you see how it's sucking in. That's, that's the amazing. whole that's the whole engineering of it. Uh, lazy fire fire goes everywhere. Right. That's what we call lazy fire. Open right. flame, it goes everywhere. Our system, it sucks it in. The air is sucking it in and it's sucking out of here. Awesome. Ooh, and not, you yeah, see. Now you can see the flames coming through. Okay, check now, but check how little smoke. Right, it's like it was we there got and flame. now it's gone. You got flames. You put uh, rocks and you put your pot right on right on there. You rocks. build a skirt I had around it. Yeah, you take your rocks, you put your pot right on there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and mean, by the way, put the outside. I know. That's the insulation. It's just as cool. You know? Yeah. Put it outside. Now I mean, the flames are like tall. Yeah, the flames are tall but and it's just as cool. There's no heat whatsoever. No. So it's safe. One of the problems that you have with open flame fires, kids fall into it. No. And see, this, this can be touched. You know, all the flame, it can hey. be touched and, and there's, uh, and it's safe. Mm -hmm. Dr. Crockett, I gotta say. This has been an amazing experience. Well, great, From great. the smoke to the mud, the cement, the straw to the flame to the yes. stove. The stove. This is stove. great. Thank you so much well, for showing so us welcome. this. And, and I can't wait for this information to be disseminated so more people can know that there yes. are solutions to yes. huge problems. Yes, exactly. It has Simple been an solution. honor meeting you. It's been an honor to, for you to be here, <laughs> for us to have this opportunity to show you how the fuel efficient stove works. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm sure more houses proud. Oh yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think on a local basis. I, 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 I really feel like I think on a global basis. And you know, as as they love to say at Morehouse, you know, think globally, act locally. This has been an amazing experience meeting my new friend, Dr. Hassan Crockett from Morehouse College right here in Atlanta, learning how simple things and simple materials from everywhere can be used to make amazing change around the world. I can't wait to see you next time. Take care. I'm Lindsay Harper for Green Forum Forward. <laughs>